Please welcome DA Pennebaker and Chris Hedges. Penny, let me uh, start with you. And I know that you had, uh, and I, I'm not sure where this falls in the timeline, but you had some history with Norman Mailer, right? You had, uh, you had worked as a cameraman on, uh, yeah. Uh, Norman said, you know, uh, this is something you should film. And I said, well, Norman, I, I'm not sure I can afford to film it. I gotta get cameramen and film and, and go to a lab. So he said, well, I'll give you $3,000. And, and I said, well, okay, that's a start. And, uh, and so I, I did go in, and there were three of us in town that, that night, Jim Desmond, Mark Woodcock, and myself, who knew how to run the camera. So we, it, we were not what we'd call a, a, a fully engaged crew. I don't know, but you know, when I watch it, I haven't seen it for a while. And uh, I always really loved it. I loved the way Chris edited it, because she, she made sense out of what at the time seemed to me just kind of held her skelter. Uh, if you watch it, I mean, if you were looking for cinematography, this is not gonna make the grade. <laughs> but the fact is, we were really good at watching people. We learned how to watch people, no matter, uh, and we could get, we could zoom in on them and focus fast, and th that's really what it's about. It's not a movie of, of uh, uh, well, of scenes, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, but it is watching people and their most wonderful moments of interchange. And I, I think that's what gives the whole film a kind of elegance. Well, basically, it was just on a shelf. He had a shelf, and these were all the films that, you know, I in those days, um, a lot of times, Penny would go out and just shoot things, you know. And this was an instance where Norman came to him right before it happened. And he went out and shot it. And as you can see, it's, you know, the roughest thing that, you know, ever, even though Penny loves the elegance of it. And it does, it, it is made by the cinematography, but the cinematography is like, I don't know if you guys were thinking you were at a rock concert or what, but it was, you know, incredibly rough. Um, but the subject matter was so interesting to me. And Penny just, you know, took it off, you know, and said, this is, this is something that's never been edited and I think it's interesting. And for me, these women, you know, had really shaped the whole beginning of the, you know, women's movement. And, you know, I, we watched it together and I was fascinated by it because not only was it important kind of politically in kind of the journey of women's liberation and the women's movement, but also, you know, it was so much, you know, there's so much sexual tension going on between Norman and Jermaine in it. I felt that it was, you know, I almost edited it as a love story in a certain <laughs> way. <laughs> and, you know, and the event was just so New York. I mean, it was, you know, everybody who was anybody had to be there that night. I mean, I don't know if it has a women's sensibility or not to it. Um, you know, I hope that I was able to edit it in, in a way that gave voice to you know, whatever each of them were saying, including Norman. I mean, Norman was just as important, you know, for me as any of them. I mean, the challenge for me at the time was, you know, this was made at a time when each roll of film was 10 minutes long. So every 10 minutes, one of these three cameramen were changing their reels. And, you know, so the or coverage, from the guy that was right, and or hiding from the guy who was chasing you. Uh, you know, so the coverage was, you know, very difficult to make a story from. And, you know, the event lasted, I think, about two and a half hours. So I also had to shorten um, all the women's speeches, uh, which, you know, I put a lot of thought into. Um, you know, lot some of it I had to do because eventually I couldn't even find coverage for it. But, um, you know, I really wanted to be able to capture what they said, and you know, eventually I had to show it to each of them and have them kind of agree that, you know, their manifestos were, you know, true still in the film. But this was the beginning of our collaboration. Yes. And uh, you know, I don't know if it influenced our continued collaboration. No, no, no Bob Drew. Not. Bob Drew. She went to Bob Drew looking for a job, and Bob said, "I don't have any jobs." but maybe you should go see Penny Baker. He might, the fact is that we were just about to go out of business, so it was, th it was our last days on earth. And she appeared and said, I'm looking for a job. And we sat down and talked for about an hour. And I thought, this is the person 
for whom I've been looking all my life to help to make a partner uh, in making films. And I thought, but it's a bad time. So she went home, and the next morning I called and said, well, we do have a job for you here. And it turned out it was going through all these films I'd stuck on the rack and hadn't edited myself. So it, it, it began kind of, and, and everything got better from then on, so I assumed that was all due to her. <laughs> and I finally I came to the point in my, that I thought, I see how to make these films. I see that we have a camera, uh, which, we, which Ricky and I really had kind of invented ourselves, uh, which was a portable sync sound camera. And sync sound was important, not because you wanted to get door slams, but because you wanted dialogue. You wanted to drive the stories by what people said to each other, not by what you thought up on a yellow pad. And that was kind of where I began to see how you could make a, f a, a, so a sort of a feature film, a dramatic film like a play, but you didn't have to write it. You could find it if you had the right person and you watched them. So it, it really had to do with the ability to watch not just somebody, but their lives and, and the streets and everything going on uh, at the time you were doing it. You had to be able to watch it all and get a sort of a sense of something that you get when you see a play. It was kind of just like a play for me. I mean, I grew up at a time where there were very few women filmmakers. Um, you know, most you know, that I had have heard of, uh, of women in film were kind of women somewhere in Hollywood with white gloves on in a back editing room, you know, toiling away, basically. I mean, there weren't any women directors, so I didn't really have that as a concept of something to do. So, you know, I went to art college, studied art, did photography, and um, got into experimental filmmaking, and um, I didn't really know a lot about documentary films either because, you know, not very many were on television. Um, so, um, but basically I had read about the Drew films. Uh, very few of those films were shown on television, so the only way you could see them is if they were rented and played at some film society or something like that. So they happened to be in the same catalog that I was renting these experimental films from for a festival. So I decided to rent some of them, and um, I think I rented primary and another one and you know it it just you know that was it that changed i didn't want to make experimental films anymore i wanted to do these type of films because they were like hollywood films you know they had characters and story and drama um but it seemed like you could almost make them yourself and you could make them from a real life story so that's pretty much what i set out to try to do and you know i didn't really understand because i I didn't understand that Penny was a separate entity from Bob Drew. I just understood that these films were made by Drew Associates. And um, one of the things that interested me um, and compelled me to go when I was you know, trying to do documentaries myself and with my friends um, was that the equipment was very hard to get your hands on. Um, there were certain manufacturers that started making um, some cameras, like Penny and everyone had pioneered and invented for the first Drew films, but you know they were expensive and not readily available. But I remember seeing um, Jane at um, actually a very early film forum that was downtown. And Jane, um, which we'll be showing next which week. Which we'll be showing next week. And you know, for me, that was it, because Jane is almost like a Hollywood film, because you had this you know, beautiful star that's in it, and it's a kind of you know, putting on a play story, which is a very Hollywood construct in itself. And um, also what interested me is that Hope Ryden made it. So, you know, here was a woman also making the film. So, you know, that's what really compelled me to go. W were there other questions uh, that, that wound up on the cutting room floor, do you remember? Do you remember any? I'd, I, I Penny was away when I edited this. You, you went to Asia at this point. Um, I'm trying to remember who was who else asked questions. I don't, you know, there probably weren't that many more. And you know, as as I said, you kind of had to go with what was shot. But luckily, you know, I think 
the important people were covered. Thank you very much for coming, and thanks especially to D.A. Pennebaker and Chris Hedges. Thank uh, you, Tom, for doing this series, and bringing uh, out these old chestnuts here. <laughs>